everyone and welcome to another episode of At War. Today we're going to have a very interesting debate which kind of mirrors the debate we've been having generally in the office about international relations versus international law. Um, now we are lucky to have two non-lawyers who work at the Conflict Law Center and at RSIL, Mubashir Izri and Noor Fatma. And we're going to be talking to them, Aisha Malik, Avas Anwar, who are the international lawyers here. Um, and just to start off this debate, Which is more relevant, international law or international relations? Of course, being the gracious, you know, international lawyers here, please, we would, <laughs> we would love for you to start. I think uh, if we look at history, it's it's evident it's international relations. Uh, international law just came in 200 years ago, 300 years ago. Like I know you guys keep saying, oh, it's existed since forever from the yes, earliest of times. Yes, it did. But um, I think international relations. Okay, and in light of... What? In light of <laughs> everything, from the first th- th- stone that was ever thrown, I'm I'm going to borrow something that was said a while back. <laughs> so, That's our conflict. That's yeah. the start of just war, your Groshan theory of war, Grotian all of that theory, stuff. Which happened like 300 years then. ago. Three, My thing is that international relations is, I mean, we've, we've talked about this so much, but international relations, it when people start talking about it, they get so bogged down in what states relations are with each other. It's power structures, all of that kind of stuff. As international lawyers, we're not bothered about that. That's part and parcel of international law. But we use that to give rise to norms that govern those relations. What does that tell us about validity, what's allowed, what rules, norms are created by that? And the thing that really annoys me about international relations (laughs) is that, so I was at this conference, full of international relations people. I was a sole lawyer there. And they're talking about very complicated theories of international international relations, right? So they're like the Schelling Doctrine, you know, you, it says this and this, and we can talk about Russia, Ukraine. And then I'm like whispering to the person next to me, what is the Schelling Doctrine? Like, I'm totally out of my depth here. I have no idea. And they're like, oh, yeah. So basically, Schelling said that when you're in a war, both sides want to win. And I'm like... Are we? Are wow. you kidding me? This is your doctrine? And then you look at it, you compare that to international law, and I'm like, this is a proper field, okay? This requires, you know, knowledge, academia, philosophy, your <laughs> politics, all of that meshed together. I could be shelling. I could be Sun Tzu and tell you that, you no, know. So, so basically, in, in international relations, I mean, you pick up any common sense idea and just give it a name. Yes, Yeah, so exactly. I can say that, uh, you know, charging my phone at night is the way sun or doctrine, okay, uh, of international relations. Oh, wow. Because I want to make sure that it's there by the morning, right? Yeah, exactly. So, like, I want to have, I kind of want to win the war, so what I'm going to do is have really large forces. I should like doctrine of war. There <laughs> we go. I, I think Colin Powell went there first, though, with the shock and awe. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So you're basically critiquing the theories that fall under international They're so relations. basic. So, yeah, and also you you guys are just too encumbered are, by what states so, do. So these are backed by lots and lots of theoretical, of course, there are theoretical underpinnings, and then there's empirical data. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's something called the Big Mac theory as well, which is basically if there's a McDonald's in another country, then you will never go to war yeah. in that country. And now there, this was actually a data-backed theory. And now we see that unfolding and re- literally unraveling in front of our eyes, rather. Yeah. We have Russia that... Um, <laughs> no longer has McDonald's. No longer has <laughs> McDonald's now. But that's, uh, it's interesting because even within the field of international relations, we are in such a flux right now with the Russian-Ukraine invasion. Mm. Just this one particular war has thrown decades of... Uh, the the direction that international relations was taking has just thrown all of that out the window. Now we see this huge reversal happening. And I think our position is more like international law kind of, international relations, sorry, kind of ordains international law. It is the predecessor in that sense that good relations will dictate international law. If there are bad relations, that will also dictate international law. Okay. So that's the, that's the angle that I kind of come from, but would you? I, like to... I picked up one thing from both of uh, what both of you said. Both of you mentioned war. So in IR theory, we don't just look at war, and I think that's one of the misconceptions you have about international relations that it only governs relations when it when it's related to war. But there's so much other stuff going on. But if if we take a step back to expand on what Noor says, so like one of the basic premises we have in IR is the world is anarchic in nature. Now, when we say anarchic in nature, it's not like anarchy how you would say it 
with regards to the political situation some ways like you don't have an overarching ruling body because all countries are sovereign mm-hmm. so unke relations ko aap kis tarah karte ho and that that's where all the theories come yeah. so some people argue that you know you only look after your own national interests others argue that you can um, you can govern these relationships through um, uh, through cooperation and cooperating with each other and all of these if you take this back even further you go back to i think the um, the 1500s or the 1600s all of these go back to the the basic concept of how societies mm. how so- societies function mm. so in uh, in sub conversations ki jo basics hain so like in the hobbesian theory of how they we we refer to hobbesian theory a lot in ir but hobbes didn't specifically s- talk about relations between states he mm-hmm. talked about how societies function same goes for all the other philosophical thinkers yeah. and then we extrapolate all of that onto the state because the modern nation state system is new and all these uh, all these thinkers are pretty ancient mm-hmm. so but but i think that's an important thing to consider we're not only talking about war we're just looking at the relationship with regard with regards to other states and usme there there's so many variables at play you you look at uh, relationships of trade you look at relationships yeah. of conflict um so i think that's something international All law should understand all of this really signify how important international law is because whenever we look at international law we always look at how it's been flouted russia ukraine mm-hmm. being prime yeah. example right but when you look at it in terms of trade and treaties international law is working for the benefit of so many people every day and it's working when you have trade uh, trade like trade treaties transit treaties the entire mm-hmm. european union is run on treaties stuff like that and it has like an actual effect on people's lives and that is based on the entire structure of international law which we always then critique when Absolutely. we see it being violated and 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 I I mean you know the the formal standards that are created that are then universally accepted are because are creatures of international law right yeah. so when we when we're talking about war for example the standards of of uh, what is considered a war crime or what is considered wrong or, or even the fact that you know Russia invaded Ukraine that invasion concept is a creature of you know violating article 24 of the UN charter mm-hmm. which is a creature of international law um and similarly we see you know any violation uh, you know grave uh, breaches of the geneva conventions are war crimes those standards and those those th- that yardstick has really been created by international law which again and i mean you know barbs aside and and all of that aside um is really the formalization of international relations it's when we get into the formal yeah. domain yeah. right beyond the theories beyond all of that and you know you come to this this common uh the least common denominator often and it's not you know a treaty is not often the, the best thing that you could have come up with but it's something that is acceptable to all mm-hmm. right that is really the domain that international law operates in mm-hmm. uh universal or at least large scale acceptance mm-hmm. and then operation where you know the large largest number of states can operate within that framework and i think that is what the, the real advantage of international law uh is that we have this common platform mm-hmm. in so many different domains mm-hmm. that we can uh talk about despite all the competing you know international law uh, international relations uh elements that come in but the fact that we have this common platform i think that is the the strength of international law, that that is allowed it to survive so long Yeah and it's like Louis Hankin said that almost all states obey almost all of international law almost all, all of the of time. The, yeah. Um and the thing is that when you have states going into uh, w- when they do violate international law what do they use they use language justifying it which is entirely legal. So Russia has come up with an entirely legal justification it's not said oh I don't care about international law it doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. It says no what I'm doing is actually conforming to international law because of this this is reason. Mm-hmm. When you see um Israeli spokespeople on the TV Zippy Livni I remember watching her and she would be entirely defending their bombard- bombardment of Gaza on um IHL terms you'd be talking about proportionality military necessity mm-hmm. all of that kind of thing mm-hmm. there's a reason why um the Americans went into Iraq with like 3000 judge advocate generals right it's because international law matters the law matters they didn't take in I are realist or theorist to be like well what does this tell us about the state of the world right yeah and, and uh, I mean I, 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 I argue <laughs> that the invasion in Iraq happened because of all the hawkish uh, IR people sitting yep. there right saying exactly. that yeah this is yeah. The, you know there's a there's an imp- in, imbalance in the balance of power in this region and there's a mm. vacuum and something bad is going to happen so we need to do something about it yeah yeah I think the so earlier I said how I law people look at IR through the prism of war but I think the same is also true for IR people we also look at IR law through the prism mm, of war so I true. always use this example so so international lawyers they say you can check all these boxes 
to go to to conduct a military operation and ir people think oh we need to conduct an operation so let's forcibly yeah. check all these boxes mm -hmm. but and i agree with what you said like all these uh, trade relations between countries uh, you know we, you can just get on a plane and go to new york tomorrow and that's governed by international yeah. law i think where the the issue really comes is when states are at conflict and i think that is because outside of conflict and this isn't conflict only in terms of uh, military conflict even if it's a trade war then that is where you see some of the you know uh, international or slightly you know stretching and maybe not holding up to how you'd want to implement it but uh, but that's the problem when it comes to conflict uh, one country is more powerful than the other and um there's a, a new york times columnist i think he once said about when the negotiation for um nuclear the npt was going on or some other treaty he said you know you can get all the monkeys and all the squirrels and the elephants in one room and you can tell them all you're equal uh, you're the same size but all the but that's not true and all the elephants know it and all the squirrels know it as well yeah. so and that's basically the problem yeah. but if we take it back like because you know when i when when we were defending ir we said oh it has philosophical underpinnings but the same is true for law and what a lot of ir people don't realize is um this goes when we when you study i law the first time the first thing that they ask you is always oh, international law law or not mm. and the reasons people give are oh because some countries break the law yeah. but then some people also break the law right so do you invalidate domestic law because of that so i agree that the law does exist and just like in a domestic setting some domestic players will flout the law and get away with it yeah. the same is also true for the international arena because there's in an um an unequal distribution of power yeah i agree with that and i would say that even though we we have all these international rules and regulations but sometimes we need the stick of the of the international relations element to put international law in force mm -hmm. so this goes back to um the recent uh, eu uh, delegation that is in pakistan and in fact is evaluating our gsp plus system mm -hmm. and is saying that we need to further abide by some new conventions and treaties in order to retain our gsp plus uh, status <laughs> which is them telling us that sign on to these international law based treaties yeah. or otherwise we will you know you will suffer uh, yeah. bad trade relations and uh, but not uh, just that i mean so you know, economic if, like the, the human rights treaties that they want us to to sign or yeah. you know the the rome statute that they want us to sign yes. that that's part of their foreign policy right so they're yes. promoting that 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 element there i think uh, you know i mean it's i think the the, the division that we're creating here yeah. um mm -hmm. of of international and I, is is a very artificial one we all mm -hmm. we all know that you know you can't really have a discussion it goes hand in hand exactly yeah. without both of both of them um and and in many ways you know as we've already discussed international law is the formalization of international relations when right. you get into a formal domain where you, uh, domain where you are uh, you know speaking to each other states are, are communicating that's the language you want to use right. and and in that sense uh, again going back to the point that the 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 language the standards the um you know the environment or the ecosystem that you create the tools you use for that architecture mm -hmm. are are international law rules I yeah think. yeah and and what what international relations does is help explain why those rules are what they are mm. right like why do we have a rome statute um why do we have uh you know uh you know a, a particular convention the way it is for example the the, the law of the sea for example um why is it because there are nations that uh, have have prioritized naval warfare over or naval uh you know uh how should we say it continuity or stability over other priorities right and that is then you know explained by the by the inter international relations domain far better than it can be yeah. in so, international so, law domain so so your understanding is that international relations is basically used to explain the developments in international law because international law supposedly came first <laughs> well, that's a chicken and the egg story. and and, I and, feel like we and, are despite, and despite and despite me saying that it still does not change my opinion that you know international relations is ultimately the art of the obvious right yes. yeah we know yes. russia has attacked another country <laughs> why did, did that we don't know but we have to deal with these repercussions we know right. people are suffering right. like that. but uh, what you just said i've lost why, a lot of friends today why, i've lost a lot why did russia <laughs> attack ukraine you can probably explain that better when you look at irp so when you look at a newspaper and you say oh look at nato they've encircled russia yeah. you, mm -hmm. you look at it from yeah, a news piece perspective but mm. when we look at it we're like oh okay you know some at some level this is what a certain ir theory mm. about, says about that yeah. uh, but i also think that international relations actually is the incorporation into international law makes it the weakest because so the argument that ir theorists come to il with is that 
to make every state juridically equal doesn't make any sense because you're not acknowledging that they're so different. So to give every uh, country a nation state, so say like Vanuatu has the same voting power on the General Assembly as the US doesn't make any sense because we know that they're so unequal and one is so much more powerful than yeah. the other. And that's why you but, have a Security Council. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then in the Security Council is the game theorists, right? The IR game theorists who were involved there. And in at the time of the UN Charter, you had like 50 states. You did not have decolonization. It was way back when, when you only had, when you had people coming out of the Second World War and they were like, how do we prevent another world war happening? Yeah. And the game theorists came in and said, if you give them all veto power, they won't attack each other mm -hmm. and it will kind of keep that power in check. Mm -hmm. And since then, I don't think there is an international lawyer worth his salt unless they work for like, you know, like unless it's probably Dinstein or something who would not be like, we need to reform the veto system. Mm -hmm. The world has changed so much since 1945. You have like 200 countries now and they are all trying to claim power. And at the same time, the multipolarization of the world, it is now going through a change and maybe we will see that happening. Mm -hmm. But it's actually the worst thing, I think, in international law, the thing that protects the powerful is the veto system yeah. and for that we have to thank because that's what, no, no, that's what I was going to say. If you look at the, the makeup of the Security Council and why some countries were given a veto power, that is international relations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? You, they're, they're insecurity with, with, regard, with respect to each other. That's why you have that structure in place. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, so the evolution of the international society as we have it now over the past 300 years. So two, two 300 years ago, there were no nation states. There were only empires. Yeah. And then you started codifying all of it. But all, even the codification of law and international law as we know it, as it exists today, it happened because of international relations. I'm not saying that that makes international law inferior, which it might be, but, <laughs> that, but the point is that it is dictating all of that. It, it is creating mm. the overarching structure within which international law operates. Yeah. Now, that doesn't make international law irrelevant. It's just like there comes a point when, um, especially when more powerful states are involved, it kind of breaks down, mm. so to say. Um, and... Um, most of the developments in I law are post Second World War, and then you realize, oh, we. Could. And if you look at how the UN was formed, mm. that's the main uh, legal body that we have today. That was to prevent another war. Why do yeah. wars happen? I know theorists will tell you that. <laughs> and, and just to kind of add on to that, um, the entire how the UN came about after the Second World War that would be what many people would call the enforcement of the victor's peace, right? Mm. And that reflected yeah. the IR, IR status and the balance of powers at that point in time. And that's why international lawyers today argue why the veto power is so outdated is because it's reflecting the balance of power as it was yep. back in 1945. Yeah. yeah. And on that front, that is entirely true. Mm. My question is... Um, it kind of explains what I was trying to get at, that mm -hmm. you have all these states, you had empires before, you have going way back to, say, Thucydides, saying things like, you know, the strong do what they have to and the weak suffer what they must. Yeah, yeah. And when you translate that into nation states, we see that rules and regulations are formed to maybe enhance the power of the stronger states mm -hmm. and maybe keep the weak states where they are. And we see that when it comes to trade relations, we see that when it comes to uh, negotiations after, say, a war, mm. we see that even within like internal, internal and civil conflicts and internal within the state conflicts as well. So it is more so, it just kind of makes law subservient to the forces of IR. Mm. Or at least that's how I kind but of my order issue is that, in my So mind. then what IR does is it tells us why wars happen. And what IL seeks to do is try to prevent that from happening again. So it's kind of like tries to act as a restraint on yeah, that power. I, what I think it is, it's it's an evolution of IR. So IR has been there. It's 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 been there for for as many years as you guys will will claim it. It's been, <laughs> but 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 ultimately it's evolved into something which is international law, right? So so nothing. I mean, you, you, the the statement that you made, uh, you know, the weak must suffer 
what they must. Mm. Um, nothing can prevent that, yeah. other than perhaps you know international your law. international law right yeah. now, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's the first time in history, you know, the UN Charter that you've had a mechanism like this where that's it true. puts some restraint, right? Mm. There, there is no complete, but it is a restraint that is not imposed through mm -hmm. a force. It is a restraint that is there because a norm has been created that has been accepted, right. and that is the power that that international law really has, right? It's the evolution of these same you know international relations theories that have been in vogue at times and at, at particular junctures of time, which have been, you know, very special, um, they've solidified, crystallized and, and allowed, uh, you know, human society then evolve in that particular uh, domain. And this goes through, I mean, you can see this same pattern of, mm. you know, Article 2.4, but you can see this in every domain of international law that we recognize right now. That's right. Um, uh, and, and it's been the same. How have international relations evolved? Mm -hmm. They've ultimately evolved by, uh, by this mechanism of, of international law developing. I also feel like international law and the so entire... we're just the most sophisticated version. Of this. No, <laughs> no, but <laughs> but you're here because of us. <laughs> All right, I was, grandma. No. I was gonna <laughs> I was gonna say there's also another interesting development that we've seen since the past I think two or three decades more so is the regionalization of international law yeah. and at the same time not international relations as we think of it, but regional power politics. Mm. And I mean that in the sense, in a more constructive sense. So we have smaller organizations such as ECOWAS, which are dictated by regional powers in the West yeah. Africa region, yeah. who are coming up with rules and regulations to protect the trade interests as well as the security interests of that regional. Mm. And this is... Uh, not in contrary to what is happening at the UN level, it is, I would say, rather complementary and supplementary to that. Yeah. But at a regional level, it is more accessible and it kind of evades the question of like having no power at the very, very top because of the Security Council and the way it has been structured. So I think that's a, that's an interesting thing yeah. and an interesting point to bring up as well. And when I see that play out, I think yeah. that it gives so much leverage to the Global South as well. Because totally. if you look totally. at NATO going into Kosovo and then they argue that, oh, we have a new norm now crystallizing, which is that of humanitarian intervention. Yeah. Then you had the group of 77 countries, mainly from the Global South, including India, including Pakistan. Yeah who at the same time as recognizing Kosovo, mm -hmm. um, said also that we do not recognize that there is a customary right to humanitarian intervention. And that kind of stopped it right then and there because yes. you had 77 countries come but do out. You, do you think one the of statement. these countries can stop humanitarian in intervention if one of the weaker... Is this, no, they're because... not strong enough to do that, but they're strong enough to say this has not crystallized as a norm, so you have broken into and so that, which, that's my... which is important in and of itself. It is, it is. Yeah. But my point is at the at the, you know... So what prevents the U.S. from invading North Korea is it's not international norms. The uh, the U in the North Korea, for all intents and purposes, is outside of the what everyone considers the norms to be. Mm. It's like because someone in North Korea says, "You come near us, we'll we'll yeah. have a nuclear missile mm -hmm. come to us." And Trump you. and Kim really started to get on. <laughs> no, they, no, they did. But the point is, mm. uh, because normally we look at this relationship through the perspective of oh, how a, a strong country yeah. is, you know, uh, overpowering a weak country, which is why international law fails. But if you want to see an example of how sometimes international relations theory might be it, it's it's actually saving a weaker country from a much much stronger country look at india and pakistan because if you look if you look at our statements recently it's you know i i, I don't think i can translate it, it well so so you know how you say it in urdu hum to marenge, aapko bhi saath leke <laughs> and then no one wants to die with you so and because if if the norms aren't saving us is, is that the translation of mutually assured destruction yes <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. but at the same time no ir theorists actually thought that russia was gonna putin was gonna go in i was reading all of these uh, articles by anatole Lieben being like you know oh they're going it's such an overblown statement yeah, even the ukrainians are like, saying there's gonna be yeah, more like, gonna and happen, and like come on calm down and yet he did then go in you know so, attack. And, and guess how the international lawyers looked at this we didn't even get into this debate we can judge about hoga to sambhal lenge but is violation hogi to we'll deal with that but there's, there's no there's interpretations but there's also another thing in this uh, you said none of the ir theorists were talking about it because even in ir theory so the thing with ir is we have a lot of different schools you have people who who I'm just going to say people were talking about yeah, it yeah and they were saying this is going to happen like people like mir mm -hmm. who people like walt who belong to the realist school realist of thought school. they've been saying this for the past 20 years mm -hmm. you are pushing the world towards this but 
ever since like China, China and right now is very strong compared to where they were 20 years ago. Yeah. But even when they were not strong, since two th- the early 2000s, Mir Shamir has been saying there will be a conflict with China and the US will cause it. And his argument is the US never likes a peer competitor. Mm-hmm. Every time, because the US is a regional hegemon and every time there's another regional hegemon popping up, they just yeah. put an end to yeah. it. It's and a we can global see that. hegemon rather. Yeah, it's global. No, so yeah. he argues there is no country strong mm-hmm. enough to be a global hegemon because one, the world is too big and the second is too much water. Uh, that that's how he phrases that's it. Right. Okay. So, but but even then, so and he cites the example of so like the U.S. has done it three times in the past. They've done it with uh, Nazi Germany, Imperial Germany, the Soviet Union, and now they're doing it with China. Anytime, so anytime any country begins uh, starts to become too strong to have the he, what he calls the freedom to roam. So like mm-hmm. you can move around in other countries' neighborhood. The U.S. is like, oh no no, you're getting too strong. Let's mm-hmm. put an end to this. But coming back to what I said was um, it's. In some cases, when you look at the weak countries and um, Usme, that's their their deterrent power is what's saving them. But moving beyond this, I want to ask you guys this: um, as international lawyers, when you see the strong countries flout international law, and now a lot of the weaker countries, the smaller countries, are saying like, you know, what's the point in following this? And recently, uh, last uh, last year, there was an article by an IR theorist, and he said. Uh, China is actually giving an alternate model to the world because the the West is imposes what they call a norms based order. Yeah. Any funding that you get from the IMF or the World Bank, that's that's it's backed by reforms. Yeah. Uh, China is not doing that. Yeah. So now, what he argued was that China's development model is more favorable for authoritarian regimes and dictatorial regimes, and with that goes the the norms thing out of the bucket. Yeah. You're like, okay, no no need for any. Uh, ratifying any treaties for the GSP plus we have China. So what what do you think the future of I law looks like, especially from a from the perspective of a weaker power? Well, I think that it's really interesting because we're seeing um, a China Russia now global bloc happening. So they've been releasing like joint statements on international law, joint declarations. If you read Putin's speech before he invaded Russia, Ukraine, it was all just very critical of the West, being like, "This is not your rules based international order that you guys are creating at all." Mm-hmm. Um, and China at the same time is very quiet. Apart from on the South China Sea, you will very rarely see many Chinese positions on yeah. international law. It kind of stays quiet, does its own thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we see them emerge quite quite late. Um, but at the same time, when I look at it in terms of leverage and the global south, there is definitely a need to increase capacity here because we've been talking about this so much that there's not enough capacity in, in international law. Mm-hmm. But how can the global south leverage their capacity is all through state practice. It's through having statements, it's through having declarations, it's through giving your opinion on every mm-hmm. issue of international law and also watching what is more favorable to you. The U.S. refuses to take positions on so man- many aspects of the law of armed conflict, international law generally, international yeah. criminal law, mm-hmm. and it does that on purpose because it has all of these lawyers working together to be like, this is what we believe and this is what is most advantageous to us. The global south suffers and weaker countries suffer from that because they don't actually have these positions. And so at the same time, these norms like unable and unwilling, which kind of allows you to go in if there's a non-state actor acting on your territory and take them out if they attack if they attack that country. That is a doctrine. The rise of rich should give everyone in the global south huge, huge cause for concern. Own, up until now, only the Latin American states have come out and say, said, we do not like this doctrine, this is not applicable, and we don't like it for these easy reasons, doesn't comply with international law. The more we see of that kind of thing, I think the better for Western states, so, for weaker states. So, so countries coming together and weaker countries or the yeah, global south yeah. coming together and issuing declarations yeah. such as that. That would be interesting, but at the same time, wouldn't you say it weakens the case of international law? If it's something so good in and of itself, it should be something that all the countries of the world should be rushing to, say, sign on to all the treaties and ratify all the treaties. But at the same time, we have stronger countries yet again telling... Uh, weaker countries sign this otherwise we'll take your trade rights away what we've seen in the last decade Mm -hmm. is the lowest treaty ratification that you've seen in the un for a long long time Mm -hmm. and actually what's happening is a a recession from multilateralism in that state so refusing to accede to treaties if i was to advise Pakistan, i would say do not accede to any treaty especially not the rome statute the international criminal court because i think and when I look at GSP Plus, I find it completely new imperialist. I feel yeah. I feel like it is really using the stick approach to be like, you exactly. will do this, 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 yeah. this, this. 
And a lot of people who are in the pro human rights camp. I think it's abuse of a privilege, a uh, position of privilege. Yeah. That, yeah. That's what the West is, is essentially, or the Europeans are essentially doing that. Because we see that with, for example, our FATF uh, experience it's, it's, as well, where we yeah. have compliance that is in certain aspects better than the United States of America. Yeah. And yet we're slapped on with more action plans or more uh, requirements and more inspections and stuff like that. And it's just a question of. Uh, the global south not being effectively co-opted into international legal processes especially at human rights stuff right because yeah, I, yeah. my real frustration with human rights mm-hmm. stuff comes down to the norms and the lack of like any kind of cultural nuance the relativism in mm-hmm. this mm-hmm. so when you look at it in terms of oh, okay, there should be a right to not harm children, to not mutilate children. You would think across the board, everyone would agree with that. There can be no discussion on this, of course. Mm -hmm. What about when you see Westerners arguing that that should include circumcision? So something that religious, I'm sorry, but you cannot have blanket statements. And at the same time in the West, you now have, you know, kids being given um, puberty blocking. Yeah, yeah. And and, uh, so, so, you know, kids who, who are coming out as trans and, at a, at a younger age, the, you know, arguments are being made that they should be allowed to, to go through yeah. that. Is that not, does that come within that same, mm-hmm. uh, f- you know, definition of, of is this harm? Mm-hmm. But no, in that debate, it's completely different. In fact, yeah. that is the, yeah. the, the left's argument there. Mm-hmm. And over here, it is something that is uh, a completely different thing. So the way we frame it is also a big thing. And it's mm-hmm. always been framed in a, you know, Western European, European centric yeah. way, which is something that we can't... Uh, th- I mean, the, the, the entire thing comes about, uh, again, is is how well you play the game, mm-hmm. right? And again, it's that capacity issue that you've raised. Yeah. Uh, the, this issue of, of lawfare, where now legal mechanisms are being used to abuse states or, or, or used against states, that is, you know, uh, international relations in practice through international law. Yeah, right? pretty much, yes. Where, where, where they're looking at their interests and they're using international legal mechanisms to do that. So that space is certainly there. You know, international law is just a tool then in that sense. Um, and it's just not, you know, this this mechanistic uh, f- uh, formula uh, for, for equality that, that you know, you, you would hope that that exists there. Um, yeah, so that's that's one thing that I wanted to mention here. But the debate on whether China, you know, provides a, a better alternative to this thing. I don't think so. I don't think we're going we're, or anytime soon we're going to get to that. Because China isn't shaping how international law itself is evolving. It is shaping how states respond to, um, you know, that carrot and stick approach that the West usually has, yeah. right? Yeah. So now they have alternatives, which they didn't have, yeah. right? And that is now making them, their offers less attractive. So this 400 billion that, you know, every second year, the, the uh, G7 countries say we've established a fund and we're going to rival uh, the Belt and Road Initiative which never materializes, yeah. but say it does materialize. Mm. We now, I mean, states have a choice. Mm. And states have never been reflections of Western democratic values as the West would like to portray, yeah. right? States have had different uh, means of, of governance, different uh, governance systems. Um, and if those are something that are nurtured by, you know, a, a Chinese relationship, I think that's that's where the way the world is going to go. So I'm going to briefly... Uh talk about another point that was raised, which I think is a weakness of the IR camp here. Um, When it comes to the efficacy of international theories, for example, the rise of China, as we were discussing earlier, was sort of predicted. But international relations and IR theory in particular is as good as its predictability. If it starts, if it leads to a point where all the, where it results in a world that is still non- not going according to the predictions, then that tells you that you have uh, a very useless IR theory. Mm. That's why the Big Mac theory that I was uh, telling yeah. you about, uh, and that came about in the 70s, I believe, and underpinned a lot of neoliberal policies, underpinned a lot of uh, the notion to the notion of uh, promoting trade and cooperation and uh, moving away from a realist school of thought into a more neoliberal school of thought. Mm. But we see that go out the window and uh, we see that trade and economics is not what is uh, going to hold countries together and having a McDonald's in every country doesn't mean that there's never yeah. going to be war. So that is a failing of IR theory. Mm. That is a failing of uh, these theories not being great tools at predicting. But at the same time, we see international law is also not that great at predicting what is going to happen. I, and it's not designed... Or restraining. Yeah. Or, or of restraining. Yeah. It's not designed to do that 
as well. Mm. So, yeah. so I think you're, you're right. It's because, so if you look at the US-China conflict, mm. now realists would say that we've been predicting this would happen. Mm. People who follow the economic interdependence theory, they would say, oh, they would never go to the, a conflict and, because they're mm. so interlinked mm. economically. But whenever the conflict happened or doesn't happen, the other side will say, oh, our theory was right. Yeah. And you're right, it's not very great at predicting things, but it, it is. it can be seen as a tool of explaining things that have happened. Exactly. Uh, and then you use the past to make a prediction about the future, an educated prediction, if you want yeah. to call and it that. With the Ukraine situation, we're now seeing, and, and the good thing about you know international relations is its adaptability and its ability to, to uh, extrapolate from one situation for, for another situation. Mm -hmm. So we're now looking at the Taiwan situation, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. which is, you know, China's Ukraine, yes. right? Yeah. And 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 or potentially that could be, mm. uh, and and all the 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 arguments that you're seeing on that are very interesting arguments that are developing, and and how this now gives a green light to China to operate. Mm. How is the U.S. going to react uh, accordingly? Right. Is it going to react? Is is a Biden administration too weak to respond to Chinese? You know, and and the Chinese are you know uh, testing the waters as well in this regard. So it's it's really interesting, and this can only be done you know, in an international relations uh, discussion. Yeah. International law has very little to say in this. You you will uh, talk about it once it is up. Can I, can yeah, I just quickly... Yeah, and also just, just quickly about that point, yeah. that China is really careful about what it's saying about Russia's legal justification, mm -hmm. because Russia arguing that, oh, these two uh, Donets and Lohansk republics have seceded, and we have acknowledged that their right to self-determination allows them to secede, and then we're acting in collective self-defense. China has been really careful because it doesn't want that applied to Taiwan. Yeah. So it's been kind of like you know saying i'm not going to say anything about russia but i'm also i can't go that that far that in favor far, because yeah. like what it, what does that mean for Tibet? what does that mean for taiwan I, I just want to add something to what you said earlier about, you know, the third world approaches. Um, so if you look at how society has evolved, uh, most of international law was codified post Second World War. But by that time, a lot of the global South as it, as it exists now, they were colonies of the West. Mm. So there was no capacity. Yeah. And all these new countries were automatically part of treaties or they were, it was just a mere formality. Even now, when you compare the judicial capacity or the legal capacity of all the countries in the West, uh, it's and with the global south, there there is no comparison. Mm -hmm. Um, and so uh, what you guys said that you know it's in their arms. I law has become a foreign policy tool, you know, and the way they use it, you know, I always say uh, with them, it's always a game of semantics. You know, the West always say, oh, this country has liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. Who decides what a liberal democracy? Who yeah. decides what a democracy is and what is liberal? And now, what combination is a liberal democracy? And who decides that is so great? Yeah. I mean, yours gave you Trump and fascism. So. <laughs> and yeah. children in cages. Yeah. How bad does it get? <laughs> you know. Uh, but, but the other thing I would also say is like, Aisha, you mentioned earlier, China is very careful about what they say, and that's true. But I think the amount of we we don't really get to see a lot of the chinese narrative mm -hmm. so i just found out two days ago blinken had a statement a while back mm -hmm. and china didn't say anything for a couple of weeks then they released a twenty five thousand word statement oh, wow. on it we yeah. never get to hear about this mm -hmm. because our discourse is so dominated by the yes. western news outlet mm -hmm. so we're like oh okay the u.s said something china is like just meekly mm -hmm. gone back in a corner and they just they just shut up but they don't they are slowly establishing their their positions i back in 2015 uh, 2015 their white paper they specifically outlined that we want to become a major player yeah. uh, in maintaining global peace. So things like that, they have been putting them out there. And the people in the US and the West, they do study them. Yeah. But because our discourse doesn't really pick up on Chinese resources, we... Uh, and, and I think that that also is, is um, you know, explains the different approaches to international relations that stays there. So you have the West, which has this loud, flashy yeah. way of, of, you know, uh, signaling or messaging its its yeah. its intent and or whatever, and then you have China, which you know you haven't even heard of some of the things, but the people who need to hear have heard, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Uh, China has sent that message across. Um, so so this is another way uh, where, uh, and this could manifest in in international law development as well, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Where where you have these silent approaches, which are. Uh, developed instead of having these large multilateral treaties, you have these regional things that are evolving, like mm -hmm. the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, or or where where new norms of international law mm -hmm. are evolving and developing uh, regionally, as opposed to having it at the global level all at once. I would say that just as we're arguing that maybe international law has been kind of captured by Western interests, we can argue the same for international relations yeah, as well, sure. because our, all IR theory we study is coming from very, very specific scholars based in, say, the U.S. Mm -hmm. or Great Britain or Definitely. in Europe, and mm -hmm. we're studying those perspectives. I remember back in university, um, a Chinese uh, expert 
um, in one of my really introductory Paul 101 classes mentioned that, you know, we always, uh, we always discuss China and the rise of China, and we try to deconstruct that through the lens of the West and the theories that the West have come out. And again, Western liberal democracy, you're there for four or five years, you do what you can, and yeah. then you're thinking about your next term. But then this expert mentioned that Chinese authorities never believe in such short time frame. So Chinese mm. foreign policy evolves. They look at the next 100 years. They look at yeah. the next 50 years. And that's why we see China being so quiet because right. our frame, our lens, we're just so hyper-focused on the next year, the next four years, the next term, maybe at best the next 10 years. Because but, it's so focused on democratic elections. Right? Exactly. Yeah, but also, exactly. also, if you look at the, the social and political makeup, of societies mm -hmm. um, so there was this uh, research that I was doing on how if there's a conflict in the South China Sea there will be human security implications and how the West and the East would, would react mm -hmm. and generally in the West there is more you, there is more of a focus on the individual so then you'll be like oh human security is being violated but if you look at the Eastern cultures we value the collective more than the yeah. individual yeah. so we yeah. and even if you look at countries like Pakistan we'll be like okay we're willing to sacrifice some of our individual liberties for the larger uh, the larger good but going back to what you said about how the the u.s is all flashy i remember this guy i saw in new york i think i told you two days back so this guy was wearing a shirt which says winner of two consecutive world wars is like the most one of the most <laughs> obnoxious oh things God. i've seen <laughs> but, but, but if we can if we can bring it to a close moving forward uh what do you think um what should be the way for pakistan with regards to you know reconciling ir theory because i think one of our biggest weaknesses is we completely ignore ilo hmm. So how, how do how do we move forward? Because in we don't set the rules. Yeah. The rules are already there, and we have to play. What you said, I think a while back, like playing. Who plays the game best? So, what, as international lawyers, what would you say is the roadmap for? Pakistan? I think really international law only comes to the fore in everyone's brain when you have something like Yadav happening. Yes. So it's yeah. like, are we going to get dragged in front of an international court? How can we prevent that from happening? Um, and that's only most things by international law. Yeah, but. But the fact that we don't think about it more uh, is what leads us into those fat situations, yeah. right? Yeah. Where you're yeah. grey-listed and you say, oh, we're grey-listed now. Mm -hmm. No, this is the third time you've been grey-listed. Yeah. You could have seen this a mile, uh, a mile away. Yeah, a mile away. Um, so, so the, I mean, for Pakistan right now, and, and this has been something that we've been... Uh, we don't have enough IR capacity in Pakistan, let alone mm -hmm. IL, uh, international law capacity. Um, develop both your capacities. Yeah. I just feel that, you know, there is a bigger ecosystem for IR to flourish in Pakistan, both in academia as well as, you know, in think tanks, in, in you have the foreign office um, uh, as, as, as someone, and, and you have a place for, you know, IRP, right? Yeah. There's a career trajectory. For international law, you don't. Other than, you know, uh, academia and RSIL, <laughs> we have very few job opportunities there, yeah. right? And, and, and even in academia, you have, international law is, is one of the, subjects on the side that is taught as part of the LLB program, right? It's not a core uh, uh, thing. You don't have enough specialization. You certainly don't have the research that is needed to, to develop this. Because international law, as we've repeatedly said uh, from our platform at RSL, mm -hmm. it requires, it flourishes in, in the academy. Right? It flourishes in universities. That's where the, the arguments are developed. That's where, you know, really your sources and your foundation is developed. Mm -hmm. um, and that then has to feed directly into industry uh, or, or directly into, uh, you know, your, your foreign office or your international law practitioners. Um, and, and we don't have any of that. Right? We have very little international capacity at, uh, in, in universities. Mm -hmm. And then there are almost virtually no job opportunities for these individuals. So unless we start developing that, and we make an ecosystem for international law, you're going to have that. And if you're heavy on just one side, you are going to get those shocks, like the fat of shock, like yeah. the Kulbushan Yadav thing. Totally. We didn't know how to you know, fully uh, deal with that situation yeah. and a number of others, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you just don't have the homegrown talent to be able to tackle these, right? Yeah. Now we have, you know, at the Attorney General's office, we have, you know, the international dispute and settlement thing. That is one avenue which is developing that expertise, mm -hmm. which is great. But you need a lot more there. You need your foreign office not to have just two or three people um, focused on international law as well as you know all the domestic law issues and service matters that the foreign office deal with, deals with 
I think also, um, even if you were to look at things through a very hardcore IR lens, so then what do IR people say? International law is a tool of foreign policy, right? Okay, let's stick with that view. Then use international law. I think that's our biggest sure. problem. Even yeah. if you were to take, if you were to take, because the argument was never that I law has no utility. Like, even if you go back to our or, or original point, you realize now where you live, live in a world where international law has utility, then develop that utility. If you want to, like you said, we should have seen FATF, uh, the FATF thing coming up. We, we worked on something last year at RSI and they, there's no state statement from the foreign office we you have to go through like dozens of websites and there's nothing to be found yeah. people are issuing legal statements about pakistan's matters and then when um you know we're we're drowning neck deep that's when we realize oh yeah. we need to get a legal position so yeah. let's hire someone on an ad hoc basis and by then it's like we, we've had no say in the development of the discourse, I remember Aisha, you told me one thing once that even though the US is not party to so many treaties, they make sure they're part of the negotiation of their treaties. Mm -hmm. So they shape the customary law, like with the law of the sea, uh, with the Rome, Rome statute. statute. So they, they, they're still participating. So we're not saying that Pakistan should go and accede mm -hmm. to all treaties, but still yeah, play an active cool. role. Yeah. So yeah. you have a stance that has been there for like 5, 10, 15 years. So then you can make a claim if... if Within Pakistan, I would argue there's also, we don't have a lot of uh, sophisticated depth when it comes to uh, understanding IR. Yeah. We mimic what we have been taught by the West. Yeah. We do not come with our own alternative approaches or third world approaches to context. And we don't come up with our own lens or our own theories to study uh, international law and the world as it, as it is. Unless we also start moving in that direction, mm -hmm. international law might just be the best hope that we have so far. Like yeah. just clinging on to what the rules are in place right now, understanding those rules, and trying to play the game, as was said before. So she just said international is the best. Yeah, I was, I was just wondering <laughs> whose, whose side was she on? <laughs> No, and, and another thing with, with Pakistan, I think something that is part of our you know, foreign policy mentality is that you know, we can hide behind our sovereignty, yeah. right? That, but sovereignty ain't what it used to be, mm. right? It's, it's, sovereignty you just have this. It used to be, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the, this EU GSP plus uh, settlement, they are, you know, Useless forcing you to voluntarily them. dilute your sovereignty mm. there, right? Mm. And, and you will do it because you need those, those trade concessions for your economy. And I think that is, uh, that's something that we need to really understand that, you know, we we need to engage very smartly with not only international uh, relations uh, uh, issues that, that that come about, but especially with with how international law is developing. Yes. Because if we're not doing that, we're missing out, and the world is gonna you know negotiate these treaties or negotiate these norms without us being part yeah. of the debate. Yeah. And that's really and the global south can bring that accountability aspect if not just Pakistan but other countries in the global south start participating more in the current processes that we have. Mm. They can bring these countries, these bigger countries to the table and can hold them accountable or make their voices heard, that would be, again, to play the international law card, uh, that would be the equalizing aspect that we were discussing. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I I think we had a, we're all on the a, same a, team here yeah. at the end, we should be said. No, I think we had a great <laughs> debate. It was, it was actually yeah. uh, it was a very, very fun discussion. So. Absolutely. Still the art of the office. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so we hope you really enjoyed this discussion as much as we did at home. Uh, and please tune in for future episodes. Thank you. Thank you.